Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Lynn Weil, Director of External Affairs for the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, or CSET, at Georgetown University. Today, we'll be discussing collaborative science and technology development among the members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, particularly with respect to artificial intelligence. But first, I'd like to do a brief bit of housekeeping. All attendees' microphones are muted. If you're on a computer and experience any technical issues, use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to alert us and a CSET team member will try to help you out. Please don't use the chat for anything else just yet. And now it's time for our moderator to get things started. Dr. Rita Kurnaev is CSET's Associate Director of Analysis and a research fellow interested in military applications of artificial intelligence and Russian military innovation. She's also an adjunct senior fellow with the Center for New American Security. Previously, she was a non-resident fellow with the Modern War Institute at West Point, a postdoctoral fellow at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's Perry World House. Before joining CSET, she worked as a senior principal in the marketing and communications practice at Gartner. Her research has been published by a range of outlets, including the Journal of Strategic Studies, the French Institute of International Relations, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, Lawfare, War on the Rocks, and the Modern War Institute. Rita, over to you. Thank you so much, Lynn, and welcome everyone. Thank you for choosing to spend the afternoon with us. We have a wonderful event and I'm really excited to have this conversation with you and to hear your questions as we move forward. As I think about the work that CSEP does and the type of questions that we address here, whether it's questions that are related to AI talent or securing supply chains of AI chips or about how we can best ensure that the United States remains competitive in science and technology development. Or really when we're looking into what the Department of Defense is doing in artificial intelligence and how to get an edge in operational and military applications of AI. Whether explicitly or implicitly, I think that it's quite clear that alliances are at the center of what we do. And it's fundamental for us to understand how the United States can work best with its allies and partners to ensure that the trajectory of AI is positive in a way that benefits humankind overall, but is also one that is aligned with democratic principles and our ethical values. And I think you will be hard pressed to find a more successful and enduring alliance than NATO. It's an alliance that has persevered through shifting significant geopolitical realities, through wars, through massive advancements and changes in technology, in the information environment, in politics, and in bureaucracy even. And it remains as relevant and as significant today as it was on the day that it was formed. And this is why it really is my pleasure today to have Dr. Brian's wealth with us. Dr. Wells is NATO's chief scientist. He's been at this role since July, 2019. And he has a range of capacities and functions that he performs, including serving as the chair of NATO Science and Technology Board, that board's representative to the Secretary General and the NATO Atlantic Council. He's also the, scientific, the senior scientific advisor to NATO's leadership and is the leader of the office of the chief scientist at the NATO headquarters. Before taking on the role of the chief scientist, Dr. Wells had a very long and successful career at the UK Ministry of Defense, including working as the head of the ST policy, strategic research, and international engagement. I can spend the rest of this hour introducing Dr. Wells and his incredible accomplishments and very sophisticated and advanced resume, of course. But I think that our time is best used by me yielding the floor to him and uh, letting him tell us about his work at NATO and NATO's outlook uh, towards artificial intelligence and broader STEM issues. Dr. Wells, the floor is yours and we're very excited and proud to have you here. Thank you very much indeed for uh, that introduction. 
Thank you very much. So as uh, has been said, my name is Brian Wells. I'm NATO's chief scientist. And in that role, I chair the uh, NATO Science and Technology Board, which is composed of the science and technology directors of the allied nations, including, of course, the United States. Um, and I also act as the senior scientific advisor into NATO leadership. And it really is a great pleasure for me to speak to you uh, this afternoon and take, as it were, a, a 60,000 feet look at how NATO is addressing the challenges of artificial intelligence and also other uh, emerging and disruptive technologies. Next slide, please. So this slide summarizes the main themes that I would like to cover today. The first is um, setting out what the challenge is for NATO in addressing the new science and technology and technology uh, work that we are now undertaking, the emerging and disruptive technologies. Then I'd like to say a little bit about the NATO Science and Technology Organization, the organization that is charged with um, meeting the challenges of these new technologies. Then I will um, summarize the range of activities that NATO is undertaking in AI at very high level, of course, and then drill down into one example of how NATO science and technology is helping the Alliance uh, address these challenges. And finally, I'd like to draw some of these threads together to provide a conclusion before handing over for questions and answers. So next slide, please. Let me set out um, the broad context in which NATO is addressing AI. To maintain the technolog technological advances that we have and to maintain the technological edge, NATO has identified seven technologies that have been identified as crucial. My own organization, the Science and Technology Organization, has added an eighth technology shown at the bottom, and that is novel materials. Collectively, these are known in NATO as emerging and disruptive technologies or EDTs in the NATO lexicon. There are no big surprises here, but it allows NATO to bring focus to its efforts to maintain the technological edge. Next slide, please. So what is the challenge for NATO in addressing these new technologies? artificial intelligence and the other emerging and disruptive technologies. What I'd like to do is set out the differences between these new technologies and the technologies of the past. And I would highlight three things in particular. First of all, there is the per pervasive nature of modern technology. Modern technology is no longer the preserve of a few industrially advanced nations. New technologies can emerge in almost any state or indeed non-state actor. The West and its um, like-minded allies no longer have the preserve of these um, advanced technologies. The second difference is that the majority of scientific and technological advances are in the civil sector. The days when the defense sector drove the new innovative science has gone. It is the civil sector that dominates uh, the investment in these new technologies. And defense is very much um, following civil trends. So defense no longer sets the agenda for uh, future technologies. And the third difference is that we quite often talk about the pace of technological change, and that is undoubtedly true, but it's also the sheer scale of new science that we are seeing. That gives us a, a, a range of technologies that we need to stay uh, well in tune with in order to give NATO its technological edge into the future. Next slide, please. The organization that is charged to maintain NATO's science and technology edge is the NATO Science and Technology Organization. 
and it's comprised of three bodies um, shown at the top here. The first is the office of the chief scientist at NATO headquarters in Brussels. Um, that is about uh, 10 to 12 staff uh, strong. The second is the office in Paris, about 50 strong, which um, runs the collaborative program of work of the NATO allies. And I'll come back to that in particular. Um, the third organization is NATO's own laboratory, the Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation at La Spezia in Italy. This is an acknowledged uh, world center of excellence in maritime autonomy, and with autonomy comes, of course, um, artificial intelligence. Let me uh, describe some of the features of the collaborative program of work, uh, just going round from the top left here. At any one time, we have about 300 active science projects underway with a, collect a collective value of around 300 million euros um, in value. So to put that in context, that is as large as the defense science and technology of any ally other than the United States. The second point I would highlight is that we actually have the world's largest defense science and technology network, around about 6,000 active researchers from government defense labs, academia, and industry, not only the NATO allies, but like-minded partners as well. The work is funded by the participating nations. So the nations themselves decide what work they want to do under a NATO umbrella, and they fund it themselves. But in doing this collaboratively, they share the burden, they share the, the costs, and they bring a rich set of scientific expertise. The United States is the um, ally who participates in the most projects and the ally that brings the most active researchers into this network. So I do believe that the United States uses this collaborative network to very great effect, not only for its own benefit, but undoubtedly to the benefit of the other allies as well. Next slide, please. As has already been said, the role of the chief scientist is really twofold. The first is as chair of the NATO Science and Technology Board, which is the overall governance body of all of this work. This brings together the science and technology directors of the allies, the United States, the other allies, and um, a set of like-minded non-allied partners. But this slide now focuses on the second role, the role of providing scientific advice into NATO leadership. And that really um, translates into four areas here. First of all, I need to translate the science into um, products that are understandable to non-specialist leaders. So for example, the two products here, these are public domain documents. The first is the Science and Technology Trends 2020 to 2040, which was produced last year. And this represents our best scientific judgment of the development of the eight um, emerging and disruptive technologies over the next 20 years, and our best judgment on the military implications of that. The second publication just behind that is a uh, publication that we produced this year on the science that underpins the integration of women into the armed forces. Um, so that is the translation of the science into products for leadership. The second role of scientific advice is to identify the trends, not only the major science and technology trends publication, but also providing targeted advice in a timely way um, for leadership to um, alert them to new technology trends as they arise. This also brings an, an important communications um, role to the uh, chief scientist, uh, communications not only into leadership, but to um, critical organizations like CSET um, that provide us with uh, a wealth of academic and scientific evidence on which we can base our advice into leadership. 
And finally, the role of provider of scientific advice undoubtedly gives an influence role of the chief scientist to provide evidence base on which leaders can make their decisions on defense and security matters within the Alliance. Next slide, please. There are a number of areas where NATO is interested in artificial intelligence, and they're shown here. Um, it's very much grounded, not so much in the pure science itself, but in the need to support defense and security operations. Um, we're looking at not so much artificial intelligence itself, but the implications of artificial intelligence for autonomy, for example, for better decision-making and so on. So this slide shows uh, some of the key strategies that NATO has developed over recent years. And we are continuously looking at new and creative ways of moving from the science into the application for defense and security operations of the future. Next slide, please. So the technology itself is not sufficient for NATO. Technology, AI and others needs to be considered in an operational context. So we are very much focused on the transition from the science into defense and security applications. Conceptually, this can be thought of um, as a, a cycle, as I've shown here. And the science and technology, the science and technology organization is very much focused on the first two phases shown on the uh, left-hand side. So the first uh, phase is the generation of ideas for potential military applications. This is the scientists coming together and generating um, amongst themselves in a collaborative framework, the ideas that might be um, applicable to future defense and security operations. The second phase is a maturing of that into prototypes for test and evaluation. And then we move uh, continuously up the technology maturation scale um, into ultimately uh, development and production of fieldable military equipment. So the science and technology organization is very much focused on the first two of these phases before handing over to other organizations, particularly um, within the nations themselves for um, the development of those in further, um, the testing of them further into ultimately uh, production of the successful ideas. Next slide, please. This slide just gives you a few examples of the, the array of topics that we look at within the science and technology organization um, on AI. I don't want to go through any of these in any particular depth. I just want to give you a flavor of the very broad range of topics that we look at. And as I've said at the beginning, it's very much driven by the needs and concerns of the nations. So when the United States, for example, is looking at what AI activities it wishes to uh, conduct under a NATO umbrella, um, it is very much looking at its own um, needs and concerns and sharing those with the allies. And the allies, of course, benefit from the United States thinking as well. As I've said, it's grounded in the introduction of AI into defense and security operations of the Alliance. Next slide, please. Thank you. This slide and the next one just takes a single example of a topic that we have been looking at in recent years, and that is AI and big data for military decision making. Over the last few years, we've run a range of workshops um, bringing in experts from the United States and other allies to um, identify a range of potential future topics that we need to look at in order to bring together AI and big data for military decision making. And these workshops have provided uh, the basis for identification of particular issues, for example, trust in uh, AI and big data 
in decision making, the whole nexus around human and machine interfaces and so on. So this has been a range of scoping workshops to provide the basis for further um, deeper work. Next slide, please. And this slide just gives two examples of the further and deeper work that has come out of the workshops on AI and big data in uh, military decision making. And we've developed a range of grand challenges to, um, to address NATO's needs in this area. One example is the grand challenge on what we call centaur decision making, which is addressing the human AI interface. There is also a grand challenge on actionable intelligence, which is assessing how AI and big data can optimize the provision of intelligence, both into the military sphere, but also into the uh, political sphere as well. Next slide, please. And we do not ignore the ethical, legal and moral issues raised by artificial intelligence and so many other uh, new technologies. Our heads of state and government, the heads of state and government of all the allies have been clear on this. Um, in the Brussels declaration uh, of this year, they said, and I quote, we are addressing the breadth and scale of new technologies to maintain our technological edge whilst preserving our values and norms. I've said a lot about maintaining the technological edge of NATO, but our heads of state and government are very clear that in doing that, we need to preserve uh, our values and norms. And going back to one of the things I said right at the beginning, the very breadth of science and technology of emerging and disruptive technologies actually gives leaders choices on how to provide capabilities in the future. My role as chief scientist is to advise on the spectrum of options that they can have for future military capabilities. It is their political judgment um, what um, roles they can um, have that are acceptable and what roles are not politically acceptable because they do not preserve uh, the values and norms of the Alliance as we go forward. Next slide, please. Drawing these threads to a conclusion, uh, I would say NATO uses artificial intelligence in a wide variety of ways. First of all, to uh, develop better defense and security capabilities. Secondly, to support better decision-making, whether that is military decision-making or decision-making by the political leadership of the Alliance. And the science and technology organization of NATO is using allied science and technology expertise to its full potential, both to, de to deliver better capabilities and to um, provide for better decision-making and more broadly to use science and technology uh, to its full potential. Next slide, please. So just drawing this presentation to a close, I'll put up the content slide again. I hope I've explained NATO's science and technology challenge in maintaining the technological edge, what particular roles we need to address if we are to maintain our position at the forefront of technology. I hope I've said a few words about the NATO science and technology organization itself, its role within the Alliance. I hope I've covered how in a very broad way, NATO needs AI across a very broad spectrum of military and political um, activities. And I've drilled down into just one example of how NATO s and is supporting AI. And with that, I would like to draw this presentation to a conclusion with the final slide, which just um, covers again my introductory slide. And with that, I'd like to hand back to the moderator in order to um, open the floor to Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wells. This is a fascinating and informative presentation, and I'm very excited to have the opportunity to ask you some questions about it, as well as open to um, our audience. And we're seeing over 100 participants today, which is really, truly wonderful. Um, 
I want to just say a quick reminder to our audience that if you'd like to pose a question, please post it in the chat. And that way we'll then congregate them and I'll deliver them on your behalf. But as the moderator, I'm going to use this opportunity while everybody's getting their gears going to get us started. It's clear that perhaps the most important and perhaps at the same time, one of the most challenges aspects of NATO is the question of interoperability. And we can talk about you know, various definitions of interoperability at the legal level, at the operational level, at the information level, of course, but in essence, it is the ability to work together in a reliable way and to share information and to trust one another. And I'm sure as you're aware, there is a very common argument that says that advances in artificial intelligence are going to pose a significant threat to NATO's interoperability. And as gaps in military capabilities between NATO members increase, AI is only going to amplify those and make it harder and harder to work together, to share information, to trust one another, let alone to trust the technology. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit more about how this, you know, the imperative as well as the challenge of interoperability factors into your work and into the work that NATO is doing more broadly on the artificial intelligence front. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And interoperability is right at the heart of um, NATO's defense and security operations. In very many ways, the interoperability challenge has always been with NATO. Um, the allies do have um, different capabilities, not only different types of uh, capability, but at different levels of technological ad advancement. Um, and because the scientists come together at a very early stage of um, generating ideas for future military capability, and they work together um, as colleagues, um, the issue of interoperability of NATO standardization can be built in right at the beginning. Um, it's a problem that, uh, it's an issue that has um, always been with us, um, emerging and disruptive technologies, as you rightly say, can uh, ac accentuate the differences, but also it can provide some of the solutions. Um, there will always be different types of uh, capability that allies uh, use. The important thing is that they can talk to each other and AI can provide some of the solutions to that. Um, NATO has a strong role in the setting of um, military standards and standardization. Um, that can be built in right from the outset. And again, if I may say, because the United States uh, participates in so much of the uh, work of the Science and Technology Organization, the United States can look at how it can interoperate with other allies right at the outset and actually use these new technologies um, to facilitate the interoperability of what will be um, potentially de technologically divergent capabilities in the future. So uh, it, it is a challenge. I would argue that it's a challenge that we are well aware of and that we build in right from the outset in our work. Thank you. That's so important to hear the fact that it factors in not only when it comes to operational execution, but really just in the beginning of these early conversations, even among the scientists, let alone among the decision makers and the operatives on the ground. So you gave us, now that I'm looking through our questions, I'm thinking that, you know, you gave us such an interesting and in-depth uh, discussion of what NATO is doing. But of course, in order to advance a more democratic and ethical vision of artificial intelligence, even NATO needs allies. So as we're looking around, uh, what do you envision NATO, uh, how can NATO work together with organizations like the European Union working on artificial intelligence initiatives and moving forward in that direction? Or some other organizations that come to mind, who are NATO's closest allies in the AI progression? Uh, NATO has made a number of joint declarations 
with the European Union, uh, covering the very broad range of responsibilities that the two organizations have. And science and technology uh, cooperation is one of those. Um, I have good relations with um, my uh, colleagues in the European Union. Um, technology trends, for example, was the subject of uh, close discussions between myself and the relevant director generals of the European Commission. Um, we also uh, leverage the very broad civil research of the European Commission. We've both got interests in knowing what the new technologies of the future are going to be. So there is no doubt that um, relations with the European Union are very important uh, now and in going forward. Um, I would also uh, emphasize that there are a number of uh, non-NATO partners um, that contribute a great deal to um, the Alliance of Science and Technology. Um, the Secretary General has himself um, highlighted countries such as Korea, such as Japan, such as Australia, within the Asia Pacific region as particular countries that um, NATO wants to work with because they share the same norms and values as the Alliance does. Um, and in the particular field of science and technology, these countries also bring particular value to, to the NATO allies, but also uh, they benefit from cooperation with the United States um, and other allies under the NATO umbrella. Thank you. So this is a truly collaborative vision, both within NATO and more broadly with our allies around the world. One of the things that you mentioned early on is the challenges that modern technology puts forth is not only the pace, but also the scale of yep. the troubles, but as well as, you know, as the potential benefits that it can bring. And as we're thinking about this pace, uh, some of our audience members are curious about understanding the processes that NATO has for identifying these emergent and disruptive technology trends early, really early in the, you know, in their evolution. How does NATO think about this? What is this, what is NATO's perspective to this ID process? The key here is timescales. Um, we can't afford to do everything at once. Um, we need to be able to prioritize whilst recognizing the, the, the very broad scale of uh, scientific developments and, and the pace. So certain technologies, um, we can mention indeed autonomy, AI, space. These are with us and we need to address them now. Um, Certain other technologies, one can think particularly of quantum, um, may be some distance in the future. And whilst we mustn't ignore them completely, um, we can certainly watch what the civil sector is doing before we um, decide precisely where some of the military applications will be. Um, we are also um, working with a number of uh, institutions looking at the very weak signals in the civil sector that could become uh, the next generation of emerging and disruptive technologies. So the, the answer to that is very much coming to judgments on the timescale uh, at which a, an emerging technology becomes militarily relevant. And that of course is a scientific judgment. The technology trends report that we uh, published last year um, is our best judgment on um, when the uh, science will mature sufficiently to become militarily relevant. One of the reasons that we made this into a, a public document was precisely because science develops through uh, international challenge, through peer review. And so we are always interested uh, in being challenged on our judgments in a professional manner, because that is the way that we can uh, inform our judgments of the future. 
Thank you. I'd like to continue on this thread of the technology life cycle. If we're talking, if we started talking about the very early stages of technological development, we know that one of the challenges that we face in emerging technologies is the valley of death problem. It's how to transition these promising, you know, research at its early stages to then operationalizing and commercializing these innovations. So one of the questions here uh, from the chat is about how the SDO is managing these failed innovation and in science and technology transitions. Do you have frameworks in mind? Do you have some sort of a secret sauce that we might steal from you? Uh, so we're, we're excited to hear about this. The, the valley of death is high risk, it's expensive. Um, there have been no easy solutions found. Um, for me, success of collaborative science is that um, the nations then take up the uh, successful science and exploit it through a number of routes. We must recognize that the vast majority of NATO capabilities are owned by the nations. Um, NATO does own a few military capabilities, but they are by far the exception. So the science that is done collaboratively um, may well then get exploited by the nations in either nationally, if they wish to uh, uh, follow a national uh, procurement process or in a different multinational um, setting. Uh, success is um, that the collaborative science is then taken forward. Um, we can do a certain amount to de-risk the um, technical maturation of uh, the, the products. We will, uh, in some cases, undertake test and evaluation of the scientific ideas in the field to de-risk to de them on behalf of the allies. Um, but the, the, the basic value of death um, that says that scientific ideas, no matter how good they are in the first place, may not actually be robust in the battlefield is, is always going to be with us. The best we can do is um, always be looking for new ways in which we can um, use the levers to um, mature the technologies into fieldable capabilities. Thank you. I'm so glad you mentioned the robustness aspect and the transition between what seems to be exciting and lab conditions to what is actually reliable and trustworthy uh, when it comes to the integration of these capabilities into war fighting, truly. And as we continue on this, you know, on this technology evolution cycle, technology development cycle, one of the most fundamental aspects, as you alluded to through the focus on robustness, is the understanding of security and assurance. Since you've highlighted AI for autonomy several times in your discussion, so uh, some of the questions that we have here pertain to AI assurance and some of the measures that you can perhaps comment on that NATO is taken to secure its AI research and its AI capabilities as it moves forward. This is really important uh, for the allies. Um, the allies work um, at 30, there are 30 allies, and um, although they are of different scale in terms of their military resources, they all have um, one vote uh, in council. And so uh, being able to trust the AI, uh, all of the allies being able to trust the AI is extremely important. Um, that is something that we are looking at, um, how to uh, develop trust, verification of AI, um, it's it's a, a massive field, uh, but uh, I, I hope I can assure you that we are very much on the case in, in doing that. We've got particular research uh, task forces um, looking at this in depth. These research programs will spawn others, um, which other allies can then take forward. Uh, it's, it's a huge problem and uh, certainly one that we are 
um, on, on top of in taking forward. Thank you, that's reassuring. Um, I know that we've uh, begun to address NATO's work within itself and with its uh, member states, and of course with you know, uh, related European organizations and other allies. We can't have this webinar and this conversation without also inevitably speaking about competitors and potential adversaries. So I think one of the, another interesting questions that we have here at the chat is an assessment of yours of how NATO's investments and NATO's areas of focus in emerging technologies or particularly in artificial intelligence compare to what you're seeing in investments that our adversaries and competitors are making, whether it's China or Russia or other countries that are pushing um, these emerging technologies in directions opposite of what NATO envisions for them. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, when we published our technology trends report last year, um, as I've said, it was deliberately a public release document. Um, it did address not only the opportunities for the Allies, but also some of the risks and challenges um, that these technologies may be uh, used against us. Um, for understandable reasons, um, we are looking at this, we are looking at the, the, the threat of the use of these technologies against the Allies and NATO. We then get into a uh, classified area. Um, of course, I won't go into the details, but it's clear from uh, the technology trends report that this is something that is very much in our minds from um, states and indeed non-states uh, that do not share the values of, of, of the Allies. Um, we are looking carefully at um, a number of uh, state actors um, and their own um, developments in science and technology and EDTs. We take that seriously um, in terms of their uh, evolution, the pace of their development, and what the Allies can do collectively to uh, defend ourselves against that against any, any potential actions um, to, in order to maintain the Alliance technological edge. It's something um, clearly that moves into uh, the classified sphere very quickly, but it's clear from um, the publication that we made available in the public domain last year that it is something that we are taking very seriously. Thank you. As we're thinking about this, you know, broad span of actors that NATO works with from its own member states, from other allies, and of course, what the competitors and adversaries are doing also inevitably informs the type of projects that you take on, I imagine, classified or otherwise. Yeah. You also mentioned early on that another challenge that comes from these modern technology is that innovation is no longer being driven by states, that much of it is taking place in the private enterprise and the commercial space. So there are a few questions here in the, um, in the chat that allude to seeking a better understanding of how NATO works with the private enterprises. What kind of a role do they play? What is the nature of that relationship? Where do they factor in most importantly? If we start with the, um, the science and technology organization itself, um, as I said, this is a, a network of 6,000 scientists. Um, the majority of them are from the government uh, defence laboratories, but we have very important contributions from academia and also from um, industry as well. So uh, we interface with industry right from the outset of um, the uh, technological maturity cycle. So industry are prepared to put in their own money in order to participate in NATO science and technology. They find it that useful um, in order to um, work with the allies. Uh, we also have within NATO various um, industrial groups. We have the NATO Industrial Advisory Group, for example, which um, consists of individuals who, stand, for this purpose, stand away from their own um, industrial affiliation, as it were, and provide 
independent uh, industrial advice into NATO. So we have both uh, industry scientists working in the science and technology organiza organization. We have an independent uh, industrial advisory group uh, undertaking studies linking with the science and technology organization. NATO also has um, a committee uh, analogous to the uh, science and technology board that I chair, uh, which is the national armaments directors of the nations. The United States, of course, um, a member of that, as are the national armaments directors of the other allies. And these, the, this body brings together, as it were, the capability requirements and the industrial production uh, requirements, which are largely done by the nations, um, but there is uh, mechanisms by which um, NATO can act as a forum for consultations and transparency. Um, needless to say, um, that uh, committee and my own science and technology board um, work very closely together. So there is, um, in practice, a very strong relationship, not only uh, between the scientists and uh, industry, but also between the scientists and the national um, defense production uh, system as well. That's, that's great and it's very encouraging because without those collaborations, there's very little hope on gaining that advantage. Yeah. I wanna continue on this thread. I think in, um, in following the trials and tribulations uh, the Department of Defense in the United States is facing when it comes to procurement, uh, of emerging technologies and development of artificial intelligence. Part of the challenge of working in a massive bureaucracy is being able to work effectively with some of these uh, you know, exciting and rapidly moving startups and smaller businesses where a lot of the innovation is in fact happening. So it's not just these tech giants that are driving innovation, but there's a lot of really exciting smaller AI startups and other emerging tech startups that I know the Department of Defense has invested in a lot of um, efforts and pathways to work more effectively with and do more business with. Does NATO have equivalent formats or approaches or venues to work together with these smaller innovative businesses? And we'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, um, the NATO summit in Brussels in June of uh, this year um, announced that NATO would be looking to set up um, its own multinational uh, defense accelerator, building on the practices um, of the United States and of many other allies um, in building a, an innovation ecosystem um, that would leverage um, the, the, the small and medium enterprises, the startups, et cetera, um, but copy what the nations are doing on an international uh, forum as well. There are a lot of uh, discussions going on at the moment in NATO and um, shortly with the allies themselves. So um, NATO has stated uh, clearly its ambition to um, develop what a number of allies have on a national scale and to replicate that, uh, seek to replicate that on an international scale as well. So the answer is um, not yet, um, but uh, it is something that the summit announced uh, an intention to do in the uh, coming year and um, successive years as well. Wonderful, thank you. That's learn as you grow and grow as you learn. A bit yeah. of a, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I know that you've, I believe that you've mentioned Japan as one of the potential allies that um, NATO works with or looks to work with. Are there any other, um, non-European or non-Western countries that NATO is looking to collaborate with on emerging technologies and to bring into the fold in that way? Um, NATO is particularly looking at like-minded countries in the Asia Pacific region uh, that I've mentioned. Uh, so far as uh, the science and technology organization is concerned, the other 
uh, particular countries I, I would highlight are in fact uh, in Europe and they are um, uh, members of the European Union that are not NATO allies themselves. Um, uh, here we're looking particularly at Sweden and Finland, both of which have um, very strong defense science capabilities um, and inclusion of those is part of the bringing together of NATO and the European Union. Um, so yes, the, the, there is a very strong push uh, across the piece in NATO to um, link with like-minded nations in the Asia Pacific region, but also within my own sphere of science and technology, bringing in um, some of the uh, other European uh, countries that are not NATO allies uh, is, is a very important part of my work as well. Thank you. That's good to hear as well. We have about a little less than 10 minutes left, and I think I want to give you a little space to have a few closing remarks if you're interested, but I might also ask you a bit of a, you know, I want to say personal question, but I'm interested in hearing what is the most interesting or perhaps inspiring aspect of your work. So you've been there since, according to your bio, since July of 2019, right? So these are not been the easiest time for coordinating and working together, especially in an organization like NATO that really relies on these personal interactions and relationships that people build with one another in a cross-functional uh, role as yours. What have drawn, where have you drawn the inspiration to continue in your role and to build this apparatus? Whether it's something that is particularly inspiring about that work on artificial intelligence or a broader vision, what really drives you in this role? That's, that's a great question. I, I would say uh, it's the ability to draw on scientists from across the globe. They're some of the cleverest people I've ever met. Um, and to harness their expertise for the collective good of the Alliance. Uh, we are forever thinking of novel ways of doing that. Scientists love working internationally. They love being challenged. That's how science progresses. It's this robust but honorable um, challenge amongst scientific peers. Um, and I love being able to draw that expertise together and condense it into products that my leadership colleagues in headquarters would never imagine um, scientists could do. Uh, we, if we join the dots together, we can um, uh, undertake remarkable um, products for leadership. I'll give you a fresh example. Um, we're actually doing um, work on underwater climate change, looking at the temperature of the water, the salt content of the water, because we need to do that for defense and security reasons. Um, the fact that we can do that for defense and security reasons means that we can give data sets to environmental scientists um, that they wouldn't otherwise have. So again, the Brussels summit in June of this year um, made very strong commitments um, by NATO on the climate change uh, agenda. Um, the Secretary General is a former UN Special Representative on climate change. Um, my own organization, particularly the Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation, can undertake um, work on climate change um, that actually has defense and security implications. So it's joining those dots together um, that is one of the most um, productive and rewarding parts of my job. That's really wonderful to hear. And I, I share your excitement at being surrounded by people who are open to collaboration and who really see the significance and the positive that comes from sharing uh, knowledge and learning from one another. I think at CSET, we really emphasize that. With yeah. one of those. Yeah. Uh, as we're nearing the end of our time here, there is a question that was actually the first question that came up in the chat, but I saved it for last because I think it'd be really interesting to hear your opinion on this. And the question asks, 
what is the book that you would recommend to students that are new in this artificial intelligence space or even more broadly in emerging technologies? And what is a book that you recommend for professionals that are already familiar with this space, but still clearly, hopefully have much to learn? I would recommend the free publication that we did last year on technology trends 2020 to 2040 that really does look at two levels of work it starts with uh, an overview of technologies that's as it were would be for the uh, introductory um, beginner looking at this there are then individual chapters on each of the technologies um, people may not want to read all of them, um, but if they're interested in the defense and security implications of AI, for example, that gives our best judgment on AI. It gives our best judgment on hypersonics, on um, biomedical and human enhancement, for example. So that publication, um, my colleagues put a lot of effort into uh, distilling that both as an overview for leadership, but also an introduction to these technologies and a more detailed um, part for those um, who have mastered some of, of these technologies and want to dig deeper into the detail. Thank you. Developing a publication that speaks to a broad audience, those who are just now entering the field and those who have spent yeah years in trying to understand what's happening. It's a remarkable accomplishment, I know for a fact from personal experience, not an easy one at all. Uh, so on that note, Dr. Wells, I wanna thank you again so much for spending this time with us and for letting us learn from you and to hear about all the you know, promising things that NATO is involved in. And thank you so much to our audience for being engaged in the chat function and for all of your fascinating questions and I'll head it over to Lynn uh, to close us off. Thank you again. Have a great Thank evening. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Wells, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights and special thanks to our moderator, Dr. Margarita Kunayev. And thanks too to everyone who attended this event for your many thought provoking questions and comments. If you'd like to learn more about CSET, please go to cset.georgetown.edu and sign up for our newsletter and our research updates. Our next webinar takes place on November 10th when our guest speaker will be Michael Page who had CSET's crowd forecasting project, Fortel. In the meantime, please stay safe and we hope to see you again, if only virtually, real soon. <laughs>